That's right, you read the title of this video correctly. Brendan Schaub's Thick Boy Empire may be in trouble. Recently, there has been news that Cast Media, a company that acts as the middleman between podcasts and advertisers, is going bankrupt. This same company owns the rights to The Fighter and the Kid and provides ads to Brenda's other podcasts. The story with Cast Media is that Jim Cornette, a huge wrestling podcaster, just released an episode detailing how Cast was selling his ads on a commission basis, but recently stopped forwarding payments for the ads. Cornette revealed that they are suing Cast Media and that they worry about other podcasts that are actually owned wholly or in part by Cast. On Cornette's pod, it's mentioned that Cast stopped paying them late last year. There are a number of indications that the podcast bubble is bursting, which only makes this even more of a problem for the thick boy himself. Brendan Schlob Mark Harley, a former thick employee, filed wage claims against Brenda for not paying him 15k in owed wages, so it seems like money is starting to get tight over at Thick Boy Studios. In this video, I'll be breaking down the allegations against Cast Media, its founder and CEO Colin Thompson, from Jim Cornette. Then I'll be tying it in with the wage claims from BGL and showcasing how the Thick Boy Empire may be crumbling behind the scenes because of the Cast Media situation. As always, if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to subscribe to the channel. On July 22nd, episode 301 of The Jim Cornette Show was released. During the show, Jim Cornette and his co-host Brian Lass discussed their ongoing troubles with Cast Media and Colin Thompson. The relationship between Cast and Cornette was a simple one. Cast would sell the advertising for the show, the advertiser would pay Cast, who would turn around and pay the pod, while collecting commission on the sale. During the podcast, it's mentioned that Cast was never reliable at sending out the payments. Jim or Brian would have to check on it every month, but they would get the payment when they checked. It wasn't ideal, but they were still getting their money. This all changed late last year year. This guy goes from paying us every month for our advertising to all of a sudden he misses a check. What's going on? Oh no, they're just uh, industry issues. And then we get one the next month, but is it for what we thought we should have got? Uh, and then we don't get one the next month. And then you're on his, uh, you've been up his ass. And he's, oh, is it just a, no, there's no problems. There's no issues. And then we get a check, but then he's, eh. And then we find out, oh, by the way, I'm going bankrupt. With Cast going bankrupt, Colin decided to sell his company to Podcast One, a subsidiary of Live One. Subsequently, Colin told Jim and Brian that with this deal, he'll be able to pay them the money that they're owed. And as a side note, they mentioned that the amount of money that they were owed was in the ballpark of mid six figures for a few months of advertising. And dude, I need to start a fucking thick boy empire myself because that's fucking ridiculous. Happy Hippo, where the fuck you at? I'm about to start downing some nicotine pouches myself, bro. Anyway, so later on, the proposed deal to Jim and Brian is that if they agree to a contract with Podcast One, they will receive a third of the money owed to them in cash, another third in cash over 24 months, and the last third in stock over 24 months, which they obviously declined and are now pursuing legal actions towards Colin and his shady business practices. It was also mentioned that Colin was almost running a pyramid scheme. He used the money owed to Jim and Brian to fund the production of other podcasts under him. So it pretty much sounds like Cass was a Ponzi scheme. They quit paying most podcasts for the ad revenue they were getting in 2022. Cornette and Brian had to constantly chase after them for payments, which I doubt the Thick team ever did, and eventually were proposed stock options in lieu of a cash payment, which they didn't take. Cast did at one point work out a payment plan with them, paid two installments, stopped paying, and now the owner has gone dark on everyone. I'm not a betting man, but I will bet against Mr. Schlob and say that he probably took the worthless stock deal. Now that you know the story with Cast Media and Jim Cornette's podcast, let's talk about what this could mean for Baba. The first thing I want to talk about is the wage claims made by Mark Harley against Brenda over unpaid wages, and how that is most likely very close closely connected to the cast media situation. I personally spoke with Mark about this, I've seen the complaints and the proof, and what he's saying does add up. So let's break it down. BGL has made wage claims against The Fighter and the Kid, Tiger Thick Whiskey, The Golden Hour, and Thick Boy Studios. Talk about fucking terrible names, but let's go over each of them. So the first one is The Fighter and the Kid. He was fired in January 2023, where he was promised severance pay for the month of February, which he did not receive. That's two paychecks totaling $1,300. The next is Tiger Thick Whiskey. He wasn't paid for the final month of work and he still owed $3,000 for that one. Then, the golden hour, he's owed $4,000 for the months of November, December, January, and severance pay which was promised for February but never paid. And the last one is Thick Boy Studios and this is a long one. As per their verbal and written agreement, Brendan agreed to pay $1,000 per month for Happy Hippo ad reads. This was cut in half after the first month in breach of agreement. BGL is still owed $5,000 for 8 months of makeup pay plus the final unpaid month. And to add on to that, they took Mark off the payroll at the 
the end of December, despite having him work on two shows for Thick Boy Studios. They promised him severance pay for January and February, but didn't pay. And lastly, he wasn't even paid minimum wage for working 7 days a week, being on call 12 to 18 hours a day. There were some other invoices as well, like overdue reimbursement of goods purchased for Brenda. All of the stuff totaled to over $15,000. When Mark reached out to the accounting experts over at Thick Boy headquarters, they counter-offered him 7 k Like bro, this isn't a negotiation. You got an employee that you didn't pay, fucking pay them. Like for a guy that quit the UFC because of a Reebok deal and constantly talks about fighter pay issues, he's awfully quiet when he needs to pay his own employees. I'm not a fan of the fighter pay issue myself, but at least Dana pays his fighters what they're owed in their contract, instead of Brenda who first underpays his employees and then doesn't pay them at all. The way that these wage claims will unfold will be quite interesting, and based on the evidence, Papa may be fucked. A few things that stood out to me are Mark's pay randomly getting docked, or how he was always on call, which we already know what he was doing, responding to urgent texts from Brenda at 11pm at night asking, how's the baddies? It's bizarre to me that there was no defined role for him. He just had to do everything like merch, security, editing shorts, managing social media, in addition to driving Brenda to gigs, and basically doing everything under the sun for him. Where it looks like Brenda really screwed up in terms of Mark's employment is that he didn't keep any sort of time records for hours worked. No tracking of overtime or meal breaks despite Mark normally being an hourly wage employee. Mark's complaints recounts all of this with screenshots showing that he was not compensated for overtime, mileage, being on call, and on and on and on. There are all sorts of potential penalties that Thick Boy could be on the hook for in addition to back pay. What's interesting is that Mark's pay issues line up suspiciously well with the cast media stuff, so it makes me think that money may be tight for Brenda and co. Mark confirmed this by saying 100% not being paid is connected to the cast fiasco. Mark also confirmed that Thick Boy was getting their payments late from cast as well. I'd known that they were behind in payments, like I was very uh, privy to conversations that were had in the studio and maybe Brent would tell me personally some stuff. It certainly was affecting them, but I didn't know, I didn't know what the norm was, you know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, late payments, like I've dealt with late payments for like non-union gigs, for example. So I didn't know that it was like, you were getting all these regular payments and then it just stopped or had this always been a situation? That's what I was unclear on was like, what was the pattern? Ticket sales aren't great lately and they're sort of just like, there was an acknowledgement in the latter part of where I was working for him that like things were just generally trending in the wrong direction. I don't know, for a while, like I also knew they were unhappy with like just the amount of like money that they were getting from cast, like as far as the deals that they were getting and they thought they were worth more and it's kind of like, you know, I'm looking at it like, well, all your views are fucking declining across the board. In retrospect, obviously, it seems like, you know, this is all connected. Um, but I also just doubt that Thick Boy was ever profitable in the first place because, again, he hires so many people to do, like, you know, to, to make a product that is doesn't seem that profitable. And I, know, I I remember somebody who's close to him asked him, like, is Thick Boy profitable yet? And he, like, snapped on them. He's like, you don't have no fucking idea what it takes to turn a business profitable and blah, blah, blah. He's like, whoa, whoa, chill out, dude. Ah uh, yes, that's totally a sane response from a totally secure guy who's definitely not financially strapped. But what Mark says is true. Looking at Brenda's podcast, they're definitely not pulling the same numbers they used to. And he has so much overhead for the type of content that he makes, like he has 3-4 to four employees behind the scenes doing who knows what, not including the lease on his studio where he shits out the awful content. Another curious thing that Mark mentioned was that he was secretly taken off the payroll, I quote, seemingly in a desperate attempt to cut costs and make the company seem profitable or closer to it. Now why would Baba be doing that? A comment from Mr. IcyPush6792 says, I'm a hedge fund guy. Live One is a publicly traded media company. One of their assets is Podcast One. Elvio filed the spin-off Podcast One a while ago. In June, it was announced that the spin-off is being delayed due to Nasdaq scrutiny regarding audited financials. Just prior, Elvio announced that its Podcast One entered a non-binding agreement to purchase certain assets of cast media. The long and short of Elvio's commentary surrounding the asset purchase was that the podcast ad revenue is drying up and they have an opportunity to purchase some assets on fire sale. The above is just a long-winded way of saying that an SEC-regulated publicly traded company dug through cast assets figures and BAPA was undoubtedly exposed. He mentions to have emailed LVO CEO to get some clarity, here's hoping he updates us soon. If we look at Podcast One's website, it does show all of Shop shows on there, so I do suspect there is some made-off number crunching going on. And maybe that's why he's discounting everything, from his premium thick nectar to designer quality merch. There was actually something that was said during Jim Cornette show that does really well to summarize Brenda's business practices. When you're trying to fake it till you make it, at a certain point you need to stop. And 
One of the biggest problems with podcasting as a business, as a genre right now, as an industry, is too many people don't understand what the business is. And the business is a wonderful business as long as you don't pump it up and try to make yourself bigger than you are and have productions that there's no audience for. Papa Shab is clearly not conservative with his money, so the really interesting question is, will he still be a millionaire in a couple of years? He is the king of thick boy empire right now, but I'm really curious where he will be in a few years. If I were to guess, I don't think he'll ever stop podcasting or doing comedy. He's got a rich dad that will bankroll him. I do think that he will have to drastically cut down on production and his team, but he will continue to do some type of podcast because the Redact thinks people want to hear him talk and he thinks he's actually good at it. As far as doing comedy, no way he stops the only thing that he has common with Joe and the circle he hangs out with. There's plenty of comics that work the road their whole life without ever making it big or actually making decent money. The only serious repercussion I can see is him getting divorced, and even that might be a blessing in disguise. There's no way that they can keep up their current lifestyle. They've already downgraded from how they were living a few years ago. They both want to live a luxurious life, but Miss Schlob wants that lifestyle more and won't stick around for the next downgrade. Whatever it is, I'm here for the ride. And I'd like to hear from you in the comments. Where do you think Bapa will end up in three years from now? And if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to subscribe to the channel. Stand up. But Joe Rogan, I remember, like, he crushed Brendan's dreams. He's like, oh, by the way, like, on a phone call, he's like, by the way, stop putting out those little clips. <laughs> Rogan, Rogan has a point. He's like, don't put out any clips until they're, like, really polished, you know. In the corner of the couch, oh, fuck. Oh, how does this work? When he comes, his whole body just erupts. Oh, smash! It looks fucking stupid, bitch! <laughs> it's dicey because you're rolling the dice.